church family, I decided it was an opportunity that was too good to miss. Yes, it means my voice is a little bit echoey here in the hall, but this is the nearly fully refurbished hall. Um, roof replaced, um, windows replaced, solar panels on the roof, new doors, it's all been freshly painted. Um, we've still got blinds and curtains to come. We've got projectors to be put back up and speakers to be put back up, but that's all in hand. Church family, God is good. God is providing, has provided for us, is providing for us. And uh, I'm so excited that 6th of October, we're back in here, baptism service, homecoming, homecoming. Um, so uh, yeah. We're going to stream that Sunday as well. We've decided we want everybody to be together, even if you're at home. Um, well, you're going to be part of the service here and we'll live stream that so that you can be part of the homecoming, part of the baptism, and uh, we'll see what God does on that day. So I'm excited for that church. So thank you for everything you've done, whether it's uh, support in prayer, in encouragement, in giving to make this happen. Um, and to all the team who've, who've worked so hard, uh, we are nearly there with this, uh, this first phase of our refurbishment work. Church, we've, uh, we've been over these last three weeks in this series, uh, or like this is the third week, looking at the tensions that exist around the Holy Spirit, a response to some of the questions that you had as church. Um, about what it means to be a spirit-led church. And today we're thinking about um, the Holy Spirit in the visible and in the invisible. The moments we see and experience the Holy Spirit and maybe the moments that we don't or we struggle with that. Um, I thought I'd start by uh, many of you sharing that many of you will know, 10 days ago, Natasha and I took our eldest son, Daniel, off to uh, university in Manchester. That's a new experience for us. Uh, we think we've done okay parent-wise. But those, take, those questions, as many of you will know, take on a whole nother level. Um, sometimes the older that your children get, and particularly when you leave your 18-year-old son 150 miles away, trusting that he's going to be okay. Um, now perhaps, I'm sure he's going to be fine, but perhaps the greatest challenge in that is just that we can't see what he's doing. And because we can't see what he's doing, we'll be looking for evidence that he's okay, that he's working. I must say it started well. I think we've had three photos so far. We've had a, a photo of him with uh, a bunch of new friends that he's made. We've had a photo of a meal that he had cooked himself, very proud of it, so he sent us a photo. Um, and we've had a copy of his timetable. He took a photo of his timetable. It may not seem like much that, but we are taking it because that is evidence. Evidence that he must be working or at least he's remembered what he's there for. He's looking after himself as well. So we're excited by that, but it's not, it's not only our family that raises questions, is it? In things like this, our faith does the same. We deliberately, the first song that we had this morning was Waymaker uh, because it, it's got these words in it. We belt the words out, we sing with it. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Easy words to sing, less easy words to believe, to live. Now we, all, we know we ought to, it's there in the scriptures after all. A God who is active in the world today through the power of the Holy Spirit, but a God who always has been active in the world and always through the Spirit. Genesis 1, the first three verses of the Bible say this, In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void. And darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of, the God, Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. The Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. What more evidence do we want, church family? All we know in existence because the Spirit of God was on the move. Jump ahead then to Psalms and specifically Psalm 121, which starts with this. I lift my eyes up to the hills from where my help will come. 
My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. He who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. A God who is active in the world today through the power of the Holy Spirit. Then, if we, if we accept the truth of the scriptures, how come, even though that's there, even though we read it, there are times when it seems obvious that God is active in the world through the Holy Spirit, and it's, there are times when it seems less so, if we're honest with ourselves. The simple answer, I think, to that kind of wrestle, to that conundrum is this. It's how the writer of Hebrews put it. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen, invisible. Indeed, by faith our ancestors received approval. By faith we understand that the worlds were prepared by the word of God. See that point back to Genesis 1. So that what is seen was made from things that are not visible. A conviction of things not seen. Which seems pretty straightforward on the good days, except the journey of faith, as you I'm sure will know, is rarely a straight road. Instead, it's one with twists and turns that come along the way, which means sometimes there are good days. But sometimes there are days when we wrestle with the things that are not seen. When we struggle, I want to affirm you though today, church, wrestling with those things, thinking about those things, reflecting on them is okay. Wrestling with the twists and the turns of that journey is okay. With wrestling with what it means to follow him with everything we've got is okay. Wrestling with what it means to be part of this community, this church family is okay. The Bible calls us to devote our lives to that. Not necessarily to the wrestle, but to living that way. Jesus called us to devote our lives to it. What did he say? Pick up your cross daily. Surrender yourself. You might ask, well, hang on a minute. We we're just talking about faith and it talked about hope as well. Surrender yourself. Pick up your cross daily. Where's the, where's the hope in that? I think that's when we have to pause and we have to look carefully at those words from Hebrews. Because yes, faith is the conviction of things not seen, but it's also the assurance, the assurance of things hoped for. So let me remind you where the hope is in picking up your cross and surrendering yourself every day. The hope is found in knowing that that's not the full story. Think about it. Where did Jesus' laying down his life get him? Yeah, all the pain and the suffering of crucifixion represented by the, the bread and the wine that we have here. But what was the outcome? What was the outcome? It resulted in the resurrection. Let me ask you, can you explain that to me, the resurrection? I don't just mean, can you explain what you read in the Bible? I mean, can you fully explain it? What happened, how it happened, every element. In the moments when Jesus was, uh, was dying, when the moments in when Jesus had died, when the moments that he raised, when he was raised again, can you fully explain that to me? Of course not. Of course not. We have an understanding of it, but we can't fully explain it. But do you believe it? Do you believe it? Does your hope rest on it? I pray that it does, church. Let me explain why. In Eugene Peterson's book, Christ in 10,000 Places, he writes this about that moment. 
He says the resurrection of Jesus establishes the entire Christian life, our Christian life, in the action of God by the Holy Spirit. The Christian life begins as a community that is gathered at the place of impossibility, the tomb. Hang on. He says our Christian life, our Christian life, begins standing in a place of impossibility? Well, if, it, if that's where it begins, surely there, there has to be something between that moment and the possibility we see and that we sing about and that we base our lives around. Well, we find the answer, church, in Romans 8, 11. The Holy Spirit raised Jesus from the dead. If the same Holy Spirit lives in you, he will give life to your bodies in the same way. Church, the bridge between impossibility and possibility at the tomb is the Holy Spirit. The bridge between saying, where is God in this? to, I trust that God is working in this, is the Holy Spirit. It was his power that raised Jesus from the dead. And when we choose to follow Jesus, we receive that Holy Spirit, that same Holy Spirit, which means there is resurrection power living in you, church family. Resurrection power living in you. Who you are, how to follow Jesus in your everyday is made possible through the resurrection. Who this church family is, how we choose to follow Jesus in our everyday is made possible through the resurrection. Which means if we're prepared to take up our cross and die to ourselves every day, and let the power of the Holy Spirit work within us, we can go from saying, where on earth is God in this? To I trust that God is working in this through his Spirit. Essentially, we get to see resurrection in the places and in the moments of our life when we need it most, which is if you're me, is all of my life and every day. And that's the beauty of this meal. It's a meal that represents Jesus' body, what was broken on the cross, the blood that was poured out. But it also represents and reminds us of what followed resurrection for Christ and through him, through the power of his Holy Spirit, resurrection for us. We can't see it, but we believe it for Jesus and therefore we must believe it for us too. Church, we're going to pause. I've got some more that I want to share with you, but we're going to pause and we're going to take communion in the midst of our service today. We're going to worship. We're going to sing the song, How Deep the Father's Love for Us. We'll take communion and then we'll come back just to a few final thoughts. But church, yes, as you hear this song, reflect on what Jesus did for you, the incredible sacrifice that he made for you. But also, church, reflect on the resurrection that followed and what that means for us all. Let's worship. I'm grateful as we come to the table that the only requirement for anyone to share in this meal is simply that we have hearts that are seeking Jesus. Hearts that are willing to acknowledge their brokenness as we fall at his feet and we receive his grace and we see resurrection in our own lives through the Holy Spirit once again. Today as we come together, I'm here, you're in your homes or wherever you're watching this, but we're one body. We're united in Christ. As long as you love Jesus and you want to love him more, then through the sharing of the bread and the wine, we are united with one another and we're united in Christ. 
You know, we, we know about this meal because it features in the Gospels. The Gospel writers, Matthew and Mark and Luke and their John, they invite us through their own telling for us to be part of it. In fact, the way they've written and then how Paul echoed their words in his letter to the Corinthians already has us in mind, those who might be following afterwards in mind. So let me read these words that were written for the early church and were written for us. 1 Corinthians 11. I passed on to you the tradition the Lord gave to me. On the same night the Lord Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread in his hands and after giving thanks to God, he broke it and said, this is my body broken for you. Keep doing this so that you and all who come after will have a vivid reminder of me. After they'd finished dinner, he took the cup and in the same way he said, this cup is the new covenant executed in my blood. Keep doing this and whenever you drink it and all who come after will have a vivid memory of me. Every time you taste this bread and every time you place this cup to your mouths and drink, you are declaring the Lord's death, which is the ultimate expression of his faithfulness and love until he comes again. Let's pray, church. Father God, we thank you for the bread and the wine that we've just read about. We thank you that you gave it to us as a gift, as something that would help to remind us of that incredible faithfulness, that incredible love that you have for us, what you were prepared to do, the lengths that you were prepared to to go to in giving us your son Jesus, in seeing him die on the cross. Father God, we thank you for that. We acknowledge we don't deserve this. There's nothing that we could do that would make us worthy of it. And yet you choose through your grace to give it to us. So Lord, as we eat today, may we have that vivid reminder of who you are, the gift you gave us in your son, Jesus, but also the promise of what is to come because of resurrection through the power of the Holy Spirit. Father God, we thank you that today we get to share in this meal together. We thank you, Father God. Amen. So let's share in the meal if you've got juice or uh, biscuits or bread or crackers at home then just you maybe you're, you if you don't have them yet just pause and we'll uh, that gives you a chance to to catch up and make sure that you can share with us but let's start with the bread and I take the bread just as Jesus took the bread and broke it and said to his followers this is my body broken for you let's eat of the bread And then after supper, the Bible tells us that Jesus took the cup and he said, this cup is the new covenant, the new promise, sealed by my blood. Whenever you drink it, do this in memory of me. So we drink together as a sign of our unity in Christ and his victory, his resurrection through the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I'm going to read some words from Romans. They're from the message. We're going to dwell on these words. They'll come on the screen and then I'll pray. But if God has has taken up residence in your life, you can hardly be thinking more of yourself than of him. Anyone, of course, who has not welcomed this invisible but clearly present God, the Spirit of Christ, won't know what we're talking about. But for you who welcome him, 
in whom he dwells. Even though you still experience all the limitations of sin, you yourself experience life on God's terms. It stands to reason, doesn't it? That if the alive and present God who raised Jesus from the dead moves into your life, he'll do the same thing in you that he did in Jesus, bringing you alive to himself. When God lives and breathes in you, and he does as surely as he did in Jesus, you are delivered from that dead life. With his spirit living in you, your body will be as alive as Christ's. Father God, we thank you for the truth of those words. Help us to step into those words, to be spirit-led people, to embrace them, to know even though maybe we don't always see it, even though perhaps we don't feel it, we might know that your spirit is living within us, bringing life to us helping us to live the way that you would have us live, helping us to live out your love in this world. Father God, help us to be your people, living your way in the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So we've shared in communion together. What a privilege to share in that together. We've talked about the resurrection made possible through the power of the Holy Spirit for Jesus. And we get to share in that same power, the Holy Spirit dwelling in us. But let's be honest, it'd be just a lot easier, wouldn't it, if we could see the Holy Spirit? So much easier. It would even out the playing field, help those who struggle with language like, it's incredible to see God working so clearly. Some people just... They struggle with that language, but it would help them understand those who enjoy that language, but the other way round as well. It would even out the playing field. So let me, just as we close, let me say three very brief things about that that I think might help us all. Okay, the first is this. God didn't make us all of the same shape or give all of us the same experiences. I know we know that, but it's good to be reminded of it. There's intentional beauty in our diversity, which helps us see the kaleidoscope of colours and facets and textures and sounds and pictures of who God is, of who the Holy Spirit is. This means that whilst God never changes, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, the way we experience him differs depending on who we are. Sometimes even what's going on in our lives and how God meets with us in those moments. And just because I have one experience and you have another, no experience is better than any other. They might be different, but none are better. How could they be? God's presence is good whatever. However it shows up, God's presence is good. We can't go around grading it. As though we're judges in the Chelsea Flower Show. Well, that one's much better than that one. God showed up more there than he did there. It doesn't work like that. The way some experience the Spirit, of course, is internal. God working in their hearts, in their minds. In a church setting, that can mean that the worship is going on around you. And whilst it does, the Holy Spirit is working away, seemingly invisible to others, but working away in your heart. It doesn't mean it doesn't have an external out outworking, but maybe not in that moment. Maybe the change is just on the inside, and that's okay. That's good. For others, the Spirit might work more visibly. Maybe it's the gift of tongues or prophecy that we talked about last week, or of being prompted to go to prayer or being reduced to tears as you release whatever's going on inside you. The risk is that it's so often only the second of the two where we say that the Holy Spirit is at work, but he's at work in both. We are simply called to open our hearts and be obedient to his leading, whether that's to bow our heads and pray quietly in our seats, come forward for prayer or dance at the back in celebration of who God is. So that's the first thing I want to make clear, the first thing that can help us understand a visible and an invisible Holy Spirit. 
Secondly, the Bible also describes the Holy Spirit in some really helpful ways. The Greek word used in the scriptures for the Spirit is pneuma. You might have heard that before, pneuma. Dig into its original meaning and you'll find links to wind, to breath, to spirit. In case you didn't know, because some of us need an explanation. Depends how big, a, you know, good a scientist we are, meteorologist. Wind is moving air that has significant effects on the world while remaining invisible. In John 3, 5, Jesus tells us that we must be born of the pneuma. He goes on to say that the pneuma, the spirit, blows where it wishes. We hear its sound, but do not see where it comes from and where it goes. This suggests that we know the spirit in the way we know the wind, by its effects, by his effects. What about breath? Well, like wind, breath is invisible, moving air. This time, air that animates brings life to a body. In Genesis 2, 7, God breathes into Adam and he becomes a living being. In John 20, Jesus breathes on the disciples and says what? Receive the Holy Spirit. This gives us a picture of the Spirit's work as similar to the way that breath moves in and out and brings life to our physical bodies. Then this spirit, as we describe the inner disposition of someone, their spirit, their state of mind. Remember, in Matthew, Jesus blesses those who are poor in spirit. Peter describes the character of a godly woman as the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit. So we might think of our spirit, and I love this description, as the invisible bent of our souls, that shapes our visible actions. The invisible bent of our souls, what's going on inside, that shapes our visible actions. Of course, we could equally talk about the spirit being described as a river, represented as a dove. The thing being that if we choose to draw all those images together, we see the importance of movement in the descriptions of the spirit. The spirit blows like the wind, breathes like air in and out of our lungs, flows like water from a fountain, hovers and descends like a bird. And some images, the ones we've touched upon, wind, breath and spirit, signify both invisibility of the spirit and the unmistakable evidence of his presence. Both of those things. I hope that helps in uh, helping us understand more about the Holy Spirit. But there's one more thing that I want to share, and that's this. That's simply to ensure that we're looking for the Holy Spirit in the right places. Because if we're looking in the wrong places, like when we're looking for our door, key, the door keys and we can't find them, we simply won't find the Spirit because we're looking in the wrong place. We simply won't see God at work. You know, I think we can, we can take a lead from Jesus here. Jesus so often looks for God where? Not amongst the pious kind of religious leaders at the synagogue, but in a widow who had two pennies to her name. Or looked for God in a tax collector who'd gone off the rails. Or a mixed race foreigner who'd got five failed marriages behind her. I'm going to close with some words um, that I'm certain I've shared with you before, but I love them. They'll probably make me cry, but I love them. They come from Philip Yancey's book, Finding God in Unexpected Places, which includes these words from someone involved in the response to the tragedy of 9-11. I'm going to read these, and then uh, we're just going to go into a video prayer that gives you a chance just to connect with God. Okay. This is written by Gordon MacDonald in Philip Yancey's book. And more than once I asked myself, as everyone asks, is God here? And I decided that he is closer to this place than any other place I've ever visited. The strange irony is that amidst this absolute catastrophe of unspeakable proportions, there is a beauty in the way human beings are acting that defies the imagination. Everyone, underscore everyone, 
is everyone else's brother or sister. There are no strangers among the thousands at the work site. Everyone talks, everyone cooperates, everyone does the next thing that has to be done. No job is too small, too humble, or on the other hand, too large. Tears ran freely, affection was exchanged openly, exhaustion was defied. We all stopped caring about ourselves. The words, it's not about me, were never more true. No church service, no church sanctuary, no religiously inspiring service has spoken so deeply into my soul and witnessed to the presence of God as those hours late last night at the crash site. In all my years of Christian ministry, I never felt more alive than I felt last night. The only other time I can remember a similar feeling was the week that Gail and I worked on a Habitat for Humanity project in Hungary. As much as I love preaching the Bible and all the other things that I have been privileged to do over the years, being on that street, giving cold water to workmen, praying and weeping with them, listening to their stories was the closest I've ever felt to God. Even though it sounds melodramatic, I kept finding myself saying, this is the place where Jesus most wants to be. President Bush, quoting Psalm 23 in the National Cathedral, the bagpiper by St Paul's in Lower Manhattan piping Amazing Grace over and over, the sanitation workers stopping by their makeshift chapel, the Salvation Army workers dispensing grace, the chaplains comforting the grieving loved ones. Thanks to them, we know where God is when it hurts. Church, sometimes we see the Spirit. Sometimes we struggle to see the Spirit. But may we be people who sing the words, even when I don't see it, you're working with belief and faith and hope. In a God who is active in this world today and active in our lives today through the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.